Welcome to the Future Thinkers Podcast. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvia Ivanova. And this podcast is all about the future. Welcome, guys. So, in the last few episodes, we've talked a lot about technology and artificial intelligence and robotics and that aspect of the future. And in the next few episodes, we want to talk about the humanist aspect of the future. So what can all of us do as humans to prepare ourselves for the rapidly changing environment that's already happening, but is also going to increase in pace in the near future? What can we do aside from robotic brain enhancements (laughs) to prepare ourselves for this future? So in this episode, we... Uh, I want to talk to you guys about the future of work, how we envision the future of work. So today on the podcast, we have two guests, Terry Lynn and John Myers, and they're both entrepreneurs living and working in Southeast Asia, primarily based right now in Ho Chi Minh City. They've got an interesting perspective on what the future of work is going to look like for service providers and, and entrepreneurs and business owners. So we're going to talk to them about our lifestyle and our work life here in Ho Chi Minh City and just kind of get an idea of what they think work is going to look like in the future. So hope you enjoy this episode and we'll get right to it. This is episode number eight of the Future Thinkers podcast. And today we have two guests, Terry Lynn and John Myers. We're going to talk today a little bit about the future of work and what it means to be your own boss and sort of the necessity of becoming your own boss in the future. Yeah, why don't you guys just kind of introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, Again, uh, I'm John Myers and I'm a designer and entrepreneur. I've been working on startups for a number of years. And I'm actually losing my Nomad card a little bit. Uh, so we're here in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and uh, I'm actually getting married, and, and I have a house and a dog. <laughs> but, uh, I think by the time this post, you'll be married, right? Yeah, this goes so, so uh, but, uh, but I have been, I guess, you know, working from the road and working for myself for about 20 years. And so um, I've seen this evolution of the idea of work, of location and independence, of gathering in hubs like Saigon and, and Chiang Mai and Medellin. And so excited to talk about it and learn learn more about what Terry and you all have to say. Cool. Uh, my name is Terry, and I just got into this game a little over a year, almost a year ago, actually. Uh, I have two websites. Uh, one's buildmyonlinestore.com. It's an e-commerce podcast, and I also have a, kind of my own men's accessories business uh, called Baller Leather. So this, this lifestyle is not something we've really talked about whatsoever. Business, not very much in this podcast. So the whole idea of a digital nomad is someone who works online. They can be working for someone else, but usually the people we meet are entrepreneurs. They're able to leverage communities and the internet to be completely location independent. And often these guys will travel and be in a new location every three months or so. I think what people would be interested in is what is your lifestyle like and how did you actually make the leap to do what you're doing now? I grew up in countercultural scenes and so I knew from a really young age that I would be unemployable. That was just just a fact. I I was uh, very, um, I guess, anti-authority and didn't like the idea of having a job or being told what to do. And so entrepreneurship was something natural for me to explore. Uh, So I got involved in college in entrepreneurship, started my first businesses where I was doing import-export, and it just kept snowballing. And when I was younger, I took my first trip, it's now been over 20 years ago, uh, to Taipei, Taiwan, and I taught English there, and I kept thinking, how do I just keep this going? And so I just kept exploring entrepreneurship, and I started a lot of businesses that failed, and in the meantime, I started acquiring a skill set which is that of a designer. So I functioned as an interface designer, web designer, designer of you name it. And that skill has just snowballed and became this thing that's really a huge part of my life now. What about about you, Terry? Yeah, so me, I kind of grew up in Asia and the U.S. back and forth, and I always had the mindset that you go to school, get a job, go to a nice job, and retire was the path until about three years ago when I kind of had a revelation that, um, you know, working at a large bank wasn't really the most happiest thing in life. And then I think around that time, you started hearing about like people making a living online, uh, either selling products, uh, doing design work, like what John does or kind of media 
editing, like what you guys do, kind of multimedia stuff. And then I realized at some point, you know, you can dick around, read blogs, listen to podcasts, but at some point you just have to leave. And then uh, at last year, around August, I uh, made that leap. So it's pretty much in a nutshell. So, John, you're, you're telling the story of the Earth on Fire, and you're kind of capturing what you see here. Why don't you tell us a bit about that? The Earth on Fire. So the Earth on Fire um, is describing what I see as the sort of burning of the old scripts of what we're supposed to be doing. Like Terry was saying, you know, you go to school, you go into debt, uh, you get a job to service that debt, you get married to double your debt and consume more and buy a house, and then you just kind of hang out and retire. <laughs> so I took the script a little later here in life, but... Uh, um, no, really, I, I think the idea of the earth on fire is that there's just other options available. So when something else is fading away, there's something else rising out of the ashes. And so the idea of the earth on fire was that, you know, we've all heard of the four hour work week. We've all heard of uh, Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat. That was a huge book that described the forces of, of uh, globalization, you know, outsourcing, virtual assistance, all that stuff that's commonplace now. And so. The Earth on Fire is the evolution of all those ideas and the idea that you can start a more serious business on the road with a distributed team and be taken seriously and make real money. And so I wanted to describe that movement uh, and also just kind of plant the seed that this is another option that's available. So it's not just all sipping coconuts on the beach and getting passive income. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I feel like a lot of the stuff out there is really scammy. Uh, it doesn't have any longevity attached to it. It's not about quality or craft. And so the evolution of what I see of that sort of four-hour work week mindset is that you know there's something new going on. There's something that we should all pay attention to that the types of people that are showing up in these hubs, like here in Saigon or, or fanning out to Medellin or Berlin, uh, they're working on more serious businesses. They're higher-achieving individuals. I think the interesting thing is that if you look maybe 15, 20 years ago, there was such thing as a digital nomad, but he was like an offline guy. He was like a guy that had an import-export business. He didn't have to be in one city or an office, but we just didn't know about this. And maybe they're like a really small population that was doing this but we just had no idea until kind of the internet came about maybe you start hearing things like for our work week and then hey now that anyone else really can just get started today so do you guys think that this could actually be you know the average type of work in the next few years or is it just something that is reserved for a very specific type of person what do you think uh, I think there was an article by Paul Graham. I think he's called Software is Eating the World. Yeah. You guys read that? So basically, jobs are either getting automated by software now or they're getting outsourced. So if you don't want to be on the losing side, how can you leverage that into an advantage for you? And I think as an entrepreneur, digital nomad, whatever you want to call it, when you can kind of play jujitsu with that, that's kind of where you want to be. Yeah, it was interesting last night we were with someone else who had she wasn't really an entrepreneur and she had these ideas about making money and and working as a team and becoming very narrowly focused in what she, her craft is and the whole idea of like monetization was almost dirty yeah and, it was like and, a dirty word yeah wow. so a lot of people are gonna have to learn how to wear those hats and take that initiative and own their their future yeah so it's it's interesting seeing people get kind of scared about the future and scared of like, you know, watching their wage drop and they watching their hours their go terms. up. And, you know, exactly. <laughs> well, I think too, uh, you know, if you can't sell, if you don't have the social intelligence to sell in a contemporary fashion, if you don't have the social intelligence to build an audience in a contemporary fashion, you're kind of screwed. If you, it doesn't matter what your skill set is. You know, if you can't connect with people and form close, and, close ties and distant ties, you won't have a shot. <laughs> There's no way. Yeah, you were saying earlier how you think entrepreneurship is born out of necessity for a lot of people. And like looking around in Vietnam, so many people are entrepreneurs here, but it's because they have to be because they don't have anything else. So what do you, what do you think about that as far as what's going to happen in America? Um, well, I, you know, I think it's, it used to be in America. It used to be more prevalent. I don't know what happened. Uh, my mother was an entrepreneur of necessity. Single mom, had a couple of kids and uh, didn't make enough to make ends meet. So she sought out, you know, other business opportunities, started. We've had everything from little pizza shops to uh, making signs to, you know, you name it. Uh, she was an entrepreneur of necessity to make ends meet. 
And so uh, definitely not a new concept. It's just one that's coming back again, you know, because corporatism and the, the idea that the corporation is the sort of primary vehicle of wealth creation for the masses, that's fading away. And so that's not always going to be there. And like Terry was saying, any job that can be digitized uh, will be outsourced or done by software. It's always in a race to the bottom if it can be digitized. So that's something to always keep in mind. So how do you guys see the future? Like, you know, 10 years from now, what do you think people will be doing for work? I don't think this trend's going anywhere, but I think you'll see a hollowing out of the middle in terms of like kind of boring admin jobs, middle management thing. It'll either go to the top or to the bottom. So you have people that are really unequally wealthy, like kind of what you see in San Francisco now a little bit. You see like a, there's a big gap and it's having some social repercussions. And I think that's only going to get bigger as time goes. And, you know, if you want to choose the right side, it's kind of start your own business or, you know, what are you going to do, count on a corporation? Nah, no, thanks, buddy. You know, we kind of see the world as a world of abundance and a lot of them kind of look at it like all the jobs are disappearing, everything's going away, there's less and less available. I'm not trained to be a knowledge worker, so... Well, well say for example, next? say a big company has a new software that makes their HR more efficient or their accounting. Well, then you don't need that many accounts. You, you just have part-time jobs now, and you see temp agencies, their hiring is going through the roof. So well, once the software's replaced, you're not going to suddenly remove it and hire 10 more people to do what the software did. It's just going to keep getting worse and worse. Well, and the thing is, you as an individual, so you're talking about how we all see opportunities... So your brain and sense of curiosity is a muscle. It's just like going to the gym. So if you're not training that muscle, if you're sitting there in a job, then that muscle is in a state of atrophy. And so once the rug does get pulled out from under you, which will be inevitable, then you're, you know, you're out there with a big flabby brain muscle that just can't react. So it's a lot better to start training your mind now to have a ferocious sense of curiosity and be scanning for those opportunities all the time because they're always out there. Before you get there, the first step is to take ownership of your own life, whether it's yeah. your finances, uh, bad relationships, things like that, because that's when you realize that, hey, I can actually change things in my life before you tackle like building a business. Because I think there's these little things you need to take care of first, uh, kind of in your own yeah, head. Personal financial responsibility is huge. Yeah, like being able to learn things, or if you don't know something, you know, figure out how to learn it, have that kind of thirst for something, mm. things like that. That seems to be the key thing is that we all just consume in books like our lives depend on it. But that's something I see missing all the time back home. Like, hey, what are you reading lately? Like, it's a, that's an easy question. From well, usually it's book. nothing. Nothing. It's like, well, okay, what's... YouTube. Okay. Yeah, I'm reading cat videos. <laughs> yeah, so, so just to give everyone an idea, what podcasts or audiobooks do you guys have in your arsenal right now? Like, what did you listen to in the past? I, I mean, I started off pretty, pretty heavily in, like, self-development because there is... I viewed myself as the tool to do all the things I wanted to do. So I might as well work on myself first, figure out how to argue better if I need to, or how to talk to people better, how to like people, how to be effective in communication. So there's lots of books like How to Win Friends and Influence People, Nonviolent Communication. Yeah, yeah that one we read quite recently. It was really, really good. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of books, you know, 4-Hour Work Week was a huge thing to get me to, to take the leap to come to Asia. Yeah, I, I would also say read as much about psychology as you possibly can. So the best primer on psychology, I think, is Influence by Robert Cialdini, which breaks down in a very sort of uh, every man's way um, the, the idea of influence, what influences people. It's a huge book. I like Malcolm Gladwell because he takes complicated ideas in psychology and kind of puts it down to like a regular trucker level, yeah. you know? Yeah, he really does. Those are, those are good books to kind of train your mindset. I, I think if you're getting into business and you're serious and you want to make the jump, the number one you have to think about is differentiation. Differentiation is everything. And so people used to sort of like think about creating a business by, you know, imitation, not innovation. And so the best book you can read to learn how to differentiate, it's a bit complicated, but if you can get through it, it's Blue Ocean Strategy. That book's been around forever now. And essentially, it's a book about differentiation where you create the market for a product or service that you have in mind. You don't try to grab existing market share. And I think differentiation is a huge factor in business. Yeah, there's a book called Zag that's kind of along the same lines. I don't know if you've ever heard that. I heard that on Six Pixels of Separation. So. Okay want to check out too. it's a lot shorter i think yeah but like we can go on there's so many books yeah yeah yeah, this, yeah books. We, we can go on for like yeah, an hour the key is to to start cultivating that mindset you know and training your brain to scan for opportunities when i read the new york times on a sunday i'm scanning it for 
you know, how do I create solutions for these things that I'm reading? Or, you know, how do I react to these situations? Yeah, I think that's super key. Looking for solutions instead of complaining about what's wrong. Yeah. Uh, we were actually talking about that last night as well, that so many people, you know, complain. They're like, oh, the government's not taking care of us. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're taking away our benefits at work. They're taking away our jobs. People just, what well, you were why saying, Why don't you take care of yourself, right? Just, yeah. you know, yeah. And I think the number one thing, this is what I wanted to say. Stop making fucking excuses. Just stop it. Don't make another fucking excuse. If you're really serious about taking care of yourself, stop the excuses. Everybody has problems. Check them at the door. Check your ego at the door and admit you don't know shit. I still don't know shit. And start to feed your brain and be active. You know, like your education doesn't stop at 21 when you exit the college doors it's a lifelong thing if you want to survive in this game so you have to check that ego at the door and admit you don't know shit yeah and if you don't know anything you could just go to google there's some book that has about it now, unless you're trying to do like quantum physics and there's black lots holes of books about because that, that too yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah but if you want to like invent math that's a whole different yeah. level right but like everything basic that you don't know now you can find it online so you know, you've read enough books, you've seen enough success, success stories of other people who have done it, and it seems just possible. It doesn't seem like something that's worth being afraid of anymore. But that seems to be like the biggest motivation for people not to do something. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what would happen if I quit my job, went off on my own, that sort of stuff. Actually, so how I think do you a speak lot of to people fear? People are worried about what others think too much. Yeah. So there's a lot of forces that are conspiring to keep you average. Your parents, your friends. You know, and, and if you're, you got to look around at your peer group of, you know, do you want to be like your parents? I never wanted to be like my parents. I appreciate my parents and admire them, but I had a different idea of mine of what I wanted. Same with the friends I surrounded myself with when I was younger. So I actively sought people that I wanted to be like, that I put myself around. That's it. Yeah, I think measuring yourself by other people's standards is something that we see sometimes. And that came up last night as well, you know, comparing yourself to other people. Oh, I'm more creative than this person, but I'm more responsible than this person, you know, less conservative than this person. Why don't you just define yourself in your own terms? Who cares? And, and learning how to fail as well. Yeah. You were talking about exercising your brain muscle. I think yeah. you also got to exercise your fail muscle because yeah. failing is not a big deal. Like yeah. if you don't learn how to fail, you're never going to succeed. Yeah. For the, the kind of person listening to this who's looking at their future and looking at the script they're currently living in and like, yeah, it's not, not what I want anymore. What do you think they need to have to move on? Like what skill set? So there's no guarantees. I think if you're sitting at your office, at some point you'll entertain this idea, right? You'll be like, okay, this looks cool. These guys are living in Vietnam, Berlin, Colombia, wherever it looks cool. Who am I to do this? And then at some point you have to say, all right, it's either do, it's either I'm going to quit by this day or I'm just going to sit here and waste my life away and just be like a daydreamer that I want to do this. And until you get to that point, you're just kind of wasting time. So as soon as you can get to that, either by making money right away or having some kind of runway in your bank, whatever, I think that's the way to go. Because if you just sit there wasting time, you, like a year or two can pass by. And there's plenty of people who we know who are, you know, follow like these gurus who have not quit their job in like four or five years. And like, what the fuck are you waiting for? And the thing is, you're thinking to the guy sitting in the office now, you're thinking quitting is a bit. No, you're fucking wrong. Quitting isn't shit once you leave. Like once you leave, like that's when you really start get scared. Because when you don't make money and you fucking fucking go broke, that's when you're really scared. And just quitting is like a little tiny, tiny, tiny thing in the whole scheme of things. So... It's worth it. Yeah, of course. But How you, is it worth it? What but but you have to do it, it to know it, though, yeah. right? If you're just listening to us talk and you don't do anything, well... I mean, business is a canvas, you know? You can paint whatever picture you want. That's the beauty of it. It depends on your skill set, you know? But you have to shift your mind from being a consumer to a producer. And so I start to look at the world as a creator, as a producer, like, what can I create and build, not what can I consume? You know, when you have a job, you're just buying shit. So you consider yourself to be an artist. Yeah. I mean, you know. Well, we're all would, creating <laughs> things, right? Like we're creating something now by talking yeah. with this mic. So. Yeah. And business is really just a canvas to make these creations come to life. That's how I really think about it. So it's interesting that so many artists have this thing about their art. If they get paid for it, it's dirty. And they view yeah. money as supposed to be kept separate. That's another thing that came up yesterday. So how do you speak to someone who thinks that profit is about ripping people off. Fucking drop it. <laughs> just knock it off. That's just dated countercultural garbage. That's it. It's just dated. It's pollution. It's toxic. 
You know, like there's nothing wrong with making a profit, you know. And if you're the most brilliant artist that works at Starbucks, which is nothing wrong with working at Starbucks, but if you think you want to go on to bigger heights and places, then get your ass together. You know, money is just, a, it's a vote. That's it. Someone's voting, you know, and the number of votes you get, that you, that's how it tallies up. That's it. It's just a vote. So, you know, you want to get as many votes as possible. I think in, in business, like in any relationship, it has to be a win-win situation. If you're working with clients who are not happy to pay you for your services, you're not working with the right clients. Yeah, you're not working with the right people. Uh, you're not positioning yourself the right way. There's a lot of different factors, you know. But I think everyone has this fantasy about like the starving artist thing. Like it's really weird. I, I never yeah. understood it. I just it's like over glorified. Like, hey, I'm a guy painting shit in my garage, and I'm living on like tuna cheese sandwiches, and like, like, what's, where's the fucking glory in that? Like, I don't, I don't well, really dude, I grew it. up in that scene. I was a skateboarder, punk rocker, band frontman, the whole nine yards. And a lot of my peers that stuck to those ethos, they're like the guys I saw in the 80s growing up with the mullets and jeans jackets. They're talking about the good old days, about how it was awesome. But the, they're not, they didn't really do anything with those ideas because they're not scalable ideas. They're not ideas that are relevant. They're not ideas. They're, they, you're building a wall around yourself with these ideas. You're not reaching out and connecting with others. And if your ideas are so awesome, you want to be as accessible as possible not shoving people away with your wall. So I think a lot of those people are really afraid. And I think people need to realize that money is fundamentally an exchange of value, right? So when you go to the grocery store, you buy a can of grapes. The money is actually for the value of the grapes. You're not like, I mean, you're giving it to some business, but the value you're getting is in the grapes, right? So I think when these people have weird concepts of money, it's like, I'm just taking someone's money, but not, I'm not giving anything back. Right? But when you actually have something, whether you're selling multimedia services, design work, you're providing some form of value, right? And you're trading that for money. Well, even, uh, have you guys seen the potato salad thing on Kickstarter? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I think it's on like 50K now. As it's 8,000. Yeah, yeah, 60 now. Yeah. yeah. It's, on, it's trucking along and it's only nine days old. Or no, six days old rather, yeah. So you never know. I mean, it's whatever gives people amusement, right? Yeah, so, but but say, let's look at that thing. He had a goal of $10. He has 60000 hours. But the value we're getting is this joke we're having. Yeah. To, it's a topic to talk about and to joke about with your friends. And I think that's something maybe we'll just give a dollar to just because, hey, you know, I'll just give the guy for fun because it's funny, right? And that's yeah. the value you get. You get the emotional value there. And I think a lot of the time people don't see the value they get when they get for money. They think it's just a one-sided transaction. I think well, they'll fix on the number, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, you know, wow, 60000 But no, there's a collection of thousands of people that, uh, you know, put that money together. And so it's always in business when you're getting money, you're solving pain or you're entertaining to the point where someone gives you money. That's it. So enough people found that entertaining enough to give that guy a couple bucks. Yeah, I would say this is assuming you're doing something legit. You're not like or involved in deception. Yeah, or involved deceptions yeah. like or crazy drugs or anything like, or slave labor. Yeah, yeah prostitution. Or like, yeah, we're not talking about. We're talking about like legit businesses that offer legit value. The internet is causing a lot of light to be shone on those types of businesses. And it's almost becoming more difficult to do the shitty quick money thing than it is to actually just make a real business and yeah. do the right thing, you know, provide real value. Like I struggled way more when I was just trying to sell something that I wanted to sell and not create a valuable product that people wanted. They like beat my door down to, to buy. So yeah, what's funny is that when you read about that, it sounds so easy until you actually start calling people and like, you get doors slammed in your face, you're like, wow, like, is this something wrong with my product or something wrong with my marketing? Or you're just like, ah, like, fuck it, what the fuck am I doing wrong? Well, and I think that's actually, I'm going to like circle back because the topic of this is the future of work, right? So, you know, you're talking about uh, starting a business or, or we're talking about our craft that sort of uh, catapults us into a business. So, it, first of all, the first thing you have to, to stop saying is the word career. Erase that from your vocabulary. Don't ever say that again. Like, in, like, don't ever do a resume again. That stuff is stupid. Uh, you know, your life is a body of projects that are successive. And so you should be constantly focused on getting to higher and higher places. You know, so it's not about, you know, that one, that one job or that one thing. It's a, it's a series of successions, you know. And so I, I've been really fortunate to have these successive uh, projects, you know, and they just kind of keep snowballing and you have to trust the force. You don't know where they're going to come from, 
But when you're starting out, you've got to think of it as this progressive thing. I think that's really important. I think also just having a belief in what you're doing that you're going to do it regardless. You're going to be doing it for a long time. So you're building this body of work. Like I can't count how many times I got discouraged when I was just starting out and then switched and did something else. And I could have continued building this body of work and I didn't. I ended up having to start over again each time. Well, you know, I think it's okay to quit stuff, you know. You have to – no one to fold them, no one to hold them. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know, like I, I wasn't a great guitar player, but I liked playing guitars and playing in bands. I'm kind of glad I quit that. Went on to entrepreneurship. Um, you know, so uh, you got to just kind of know yourself well. What do you want to live with for the rest of your life? Yeah, there'll be some things you're good at, some things you won't, and you just have to – live with that and focus on what you're good at yeah i think that's that's another thing that some people get stuck on they feel like they they have to sacrifice something yeah. like they either have to do what they love or they have to make money yeah. like they can do both at the same time yeah. and that's just a, such a silly and limiting belief because it's not true it usually requires like a reorientation of thinking you know like there's a niche for everything out there just kind of shaking it down and figuring out you know who's got the money to pay who's got the willingness to pay And also being open, you know, like I've worked on projects that involve DNA analysis, you know, visualizing big networks to consumer internet companies to whatever. And there's kind of like a, there's a thread that runs through all those things, which is about like the space to execute against my craft, to be, to do excellent design. You know, like I work with people that get that. So it doesn't matter what vertical I'm in. I get pleasure out of working in all those things. Today we just heard about this. Uh, there's a website called Clown Dating or something like that. <laughs> so you know, clearly somebody saw a need yeah, and created clown. something. Yeah. Clown dating. <laughs> so I mean, you can. Holy crap! <laughs> I'm sure they can monetize it. I don't know if it's if it's monetized yeah, or not. I haven't you know, seen it, paid but. profiles or see who's looking at your profile to pay. Yeah. <laughs> Digital nomad dating. Yeah, That's exactly. Will robots take over jobs in the future? <laughs> So oh, they are. Uh, yes, I think There's so. No yeah. question. I think so. Yeah, I read an article the other day. They were saying by 2040, the definition of human will be a little ambiguous because we'll have, we'll all be like we'll have say I blow my leg off, I can get a mechanical leg. Maybe we'll have like heart rate monitors or nano machines in our body. So where do you define human and cyborg? And is it 50 percent of your body? Like 20 percent? Like is there even a definition for that? I have no idea. Yeah, but I think robots will take over manufacturing just because of economics. You know, so, uh, you know, there's a, there's a race to drive those types of tasks to a, a net zero cost, right? You know, where it doesn't cost, you know, where it's just like copying an MP3 file on the Internet, you know, where there's almost like a net zero cost. It's a material cost. And so I think that race is inevitable. You know, I think it's going to go down. There's no question. I think like Terry said, it's just what's the timeline look like? But, you know, if, if you're out there and you're listening to this podcast, your brain is probably in a different place, you know. You want to tell the robots what to do. You don't want to be told by the robots what to do. And or maybe so, you want to be a robot. Or maybe you want to be a robot. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a definitely a thing. Yeah, there's no question. Yeah, it would be like, how can you leverage robots to have a lifestyle that you want or to provide value as a business, right? Instead of being like, oh, the robots are taking my jobs. Like, what am I going to do? Get a neural implant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Become better. Yeah. Well, I think it's funny. Like, this, this idea that something is destroying jobs has been out there. I grew up with that because, you know, I grew up, uh, you know, the Midwest and uh, on the East Coast. So, like, that sort of, like, pro-American, uh, you know, the Japanese are taking our jobs. They were the villains in the 80s when I was growing up. Yeah, it's not like a zero sum game. It's more like it's shifting, right? Because you look at like, the music industry; they try to fight against MP3s for their life, but now they're finding like, all right, we can't do anything. But then all the music money has shifted to like live shows and like concerts. So a guy that's running stages probably has a great business for the past ten years, whereas yeah. a guy that was you know a radio DJ and you know in Idaho is probably you know not doing anything. Now. But then on the other side, he can have a podcast, right? Like now, what we're doing, anyone in the world listen, listen to this now. So there's always winners and losers. You just want to have that mindset to be like, hey, I, I can actually make the jump. I can't. I don't have to just sit here in Loserville. I can actually wiggle my way, figure out a way to get into the other side. What I also think too, like the the way to look at the world, it's not static. And so a lot of people also look at past performance as a predictor of future results. That's not accurate. 
and the world is not static. It's a system. All these things you're looking at are systems that are always in a state of contraction and expansion. Music industry is a great example. You know, the MP3 disrupted uh, the music industry. Napster destroyed it. And iTunes came around and centralized it. And now Spotify is eating Apple's lunch. And then something else will come along. And so these systems are always expanding and contracting. You could say the same for cryptocurrencies and the idea of central banks. Um, we're in a you know, in an expansion phase right now, and it's going to contract, and someone will centralize. It's inevitable. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today. It was awesome to have you. All right. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thanks for having us. So that's it for this episode. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. It's a little bit different than what we've had before. So we welcome your feedback. If you uh, have any kind of comments or questions about this episode, please go to futurethinkers.org slash episode 8 and post a comment there. And also, I, I noticed something on Reddit. There's this really cool weekly infographic thing called This Week in Technology. And I've been checking that out. And it, it's pretty amazing to see every single week what some of the new innovations are in technology. It seems like straight out of Star Trek. It's really cool. Anyway, I'll leave a link and probably start posting some of these little infographics because they're really cool. Hope you enjoyed the episode. We'll talk to you next time. Mm-hmm.